Iran Brown, a 13-year-old boy, had his nurse aunt drop him off at Benjamin Tasker Middle School in Bowie, Maryland, on October 7, 2002. Moments after his aunt drove away, a sniper's bullet struck him in the torso, leaving him critically wounded on the ground. His aunt, in a desperate race to the hospital, fervently hoped that Iran would pull through. The shooting raised an immediate question. Why would someone aim such deadly force at a child? However, Iran's aunt understood the grim reality. Her nephew was merely the latest in a series of random victims caught in the crosshairs of a rampant spree of violence terrorizing the greater Washington area. Tragically, as law enforcement feared, the young boy would not be the final target. Today, we will delve into the chilling and horrifying case of the DC snipers. Coincidentally, the events of this case took place at a time when they were tragically relevant. In 2002, the United States was still reeling from the aftermath of both 9-11 and the anthrax attacks. When anonymous snipers began targeting innocent people on the streets of DC during that same year, an all too familiar fear was reignited. The story starts in Montgomery County, a tranquil suburban area just north of Washington, DC. This county is notable for its wealthy inhabitants and calm, secure atmosphere, an ideal haven for raising children amidst the growing violence in America. However, things took a tragic turn on October 2, 2002. A routine morning run for groceries has turned deadly for a family man named James Martin. At approximately 7.41 a.m., he was fatally struck in the chest by a high-caliber bullet while shopping for his wife and 11-year-old son. His life tragically ended within minutes. The law enforcement officers were bewildered by the shooting. It was a crime that didn't fit the character of their peaceful neighborhood. It was a terrible first, never before having happened in the county. In their search for clues, the police thoroughly searched the area for bullet casings but their search was in vain. They couldn't find anything. No evidence, no clues, only unanswered questions. On October 3rd, as the police were still investigating the previous day's murder, a distressing emergency call came through, hitting the Montgomery Police Department hard. A woman had discovered her neighbor, covered in blood, lying next to his lawnmower on his lawn. The victim, Sonny Buchanan, was the son of a former Montgomery County police officer. The woman initially believed that the lawnmower had injured him. However, when the paramedics arrived, they quickly concluded that this was no ordinary domestic accident. Much like James Martin from the day before, Sonny Buchanan had been shot in the chest, and by the time he reached the emergency room, his body was devoid of blood. This development made the police extremely uneasy, as the case was progressing at an alarming rate, making it difficult for them to keep up. Approximately 60 minutes had elapsed, and at approximately 8.12 a.m., a distressing call was received again. A 54-year-old cab driver by the name of Prem Kumar Waklikar became the next victim. While he was at a gas station, a fatal shot pierced his chest, marking the second savage slaying within an hour. Police departments were thrown into chaos by these incidents. Despite the shock, the morning's carnage was far from over. Police officers hastened to the latest crime scene, and within half an hour of the previous homicide, another disturbing report was made. The victim was Sarah Ramos, a 34-year-old nanny. As she sat on a bus stop bench, engrossed in her book, a bullet mercilessly smashed through her head and out of her neck. A predator was on the loose, striking down residents without any discernible motive. The urgency transmitted over the police radios was palpable as they scrambled to the crime locations. The situation was growing intense, with underlying confusion turning into outright panic. In two short hours, a wave of savage murders swept the city leaving the authorities baffled. The relatives of the unfortunate victims were seeking answers, their concerns intensifying as the body count rose. The end, however, was not in sight. At the stroke of 9.58 a.m., Lori Ann Lewis Rivera, a woman of 25, was abruptly taken from this world while she was cleaning her car at a Shell gas station. The suburban haven was experiencing bloodshed far beyond its familiarity, shocking its residents. As the news spread, so did the palpable fear. Later that day, Shortly before 9.30 in the evening, the murderer claimed their last casualty, Pascal Charlotte. A septuagenarian retired carpenter, Pascal was merely enjoying his evening walk on Georgia Avenue at Calmia Road in Washington, D.C., when his life was cruelly snatched away. The county, typically accustomed to watching violence on their television screens, was now exposed to the gruesome reality at their very doorstep. Following an unimaginably gruesome day, authorities started piecing together the evidence. Each shooting incident occurred within a 25-kilometer range. A single high-caliber bullet struck each victim, 
suggesting that the assailant was a skilled and meticulous sniper. Striking swiftly and disappearing without a trace, this sniper left no connections between the victims. Despite the orchestrated nature of the attacks, they seemed arbitrary. The assortment of victims showed no pattern or preference. Pascal, an older black man, and Lorianne Lewis, a young white woman, shared no connection or similarities. The randomness was akin to playing a lethal lottery. The victims happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Moreover, there was no indication of theft, adding to the obscurity of the sniper's motives. Nevertheless, law enforcement dispatched SWAT teams and undercover officers to investigate the impacted neighborhoods and surrounding areas. In collaboration with top snipers, the police worked tirelessly to uncover the tactics used by the elusive killer. Despite the absence of forests or tall buildings near the crime scenes, the attacker managed to remain undetected. The notion that the murderer may have used a vehicle came to the forefront when a witness reported sighting a white panel truck near the location where the fourth victim was killed. Following the fatal shooting of Sarah Ramos, the witness saw the truck leaving the scene. The police acted swiftly, searching every white van and panel pickup truck they came across. Meanwhile, autopsies were performed on the five victims as the community was gripped by terror. Within less than two days, six innocent lives had been taken. The authorities were in a precarious situation, having no suspects, motives, or leads to follow. Nonetheless, the most dreadful sentiment was the realization that any resident could potentially be the next target of the sniper's bullet. Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose appointed his top detective, Barney Forsythe, to head the investigation. Their first significant move was to disclose as much information as possible to the public. Schools implemented lockdown procedures, armed guards monitored the surrounding area, and the first clues began to emerge. The bullets were traced back to a long-range rifle, similar to a Bushmaster. Bushmasters are the kind of military rifles designed for a specific purpose. In anyone's hands, trained or not, the weapon could prove fatal. The trajectory analysis later confirmed the police's initial suspicions. The shooter was on the ground, not on rooftops or elevated platforms. This indicated the sniper was mobile, leading to another suspicion. Two individuals might be involved in the chaos. As soon as the community realized that an armed sniper was hiding in a vehicle, panic swept through the residents of Washington. The media only added fuel to the fire, with newspapers and news channels speculating that the infamous Al-Qaeda could be responsible. This explanation seemed fitting, and although there was no way to verify it, the press continued to stoke fear. On October 4th, the sniper shifted strategies and moved south of Washington. The target that day was Caroline Sewell, a 43-year-old housewife. She was in the process of loading packages into her minivan at the Michaels Craft Store parking lot in Fredericksburg, Virginia, when a vicious sniper's cold bullet penetrated her abdomen. As she lay on the ground, bleeding, she prayed that she would survive for her two children. Fortunately, she did. She became the first survivor of the October assaults. The authorities were once again left empty-handed. The culprits had vanished once more. Detectives were left puzzled, without a physical description or reliable witnesses. It felt as though they were pursuing a phantom. It was at this crossroads that Police Chief Moose decided to place all of his trust in the public. He made an appeal for assistance. A tip line was created, and it was quickly inundated with callers. Some individuals believed they had witnessed something connected to the snipers, while others suggested tactics to apprehend the criminals. The police department received over 100,000 tips at one point. The investigators tirelessly pursued potential leads, soon realizing that the crimes were primarily concentrated near highways shopping plazas, and certain retail outlets. The crime pattern suggested a culprit or culprits who had an intricate understanding of the local traffic flow. After examining these patterns, authorities devised a course of action they termed the Concentric Circle Plan. This involved rapidly setting up response teams at the periphery of any incoming distress call. As soon as an emergency call was received, the police would form a trap encompassing an ever-growing series of circles centered around the crime scene. This included sealing off every possible exit, and filling the premises with undercover officers. Initially, the gun crimes were limited to the Montgomery area. However, with recent activity detected in Virginia, the scope has increased. The criminal could be anywhere now. A debate arose over whether it would be prudent to keep schools operational. Although children had not yet been the snipers' targets, a decision was reached to have schools continue, but with all activities confined indoors. There would be no outdoor playtime. The prevailing belief amongst authorities was that this would maintain the children's safety. On October 7th, Iran Brown, a 13-year-old boy, found himself kicked off his school bus for snacking on some candy. As a result, his aunt took on the responsibility of taking him to school, 
She left him in front of the school building an hour earlier than usual because she was running late for her own job. It was during that unexpected moment that a sniper targeted and shot the young teen, who was left to bleed out on the sidewalk. Despite the chaos, his aunt managed to whisk him off to the emergency room in the nick of time. Iran emerged as the second person to survive the harrowing DC sniper attacks, a chilling reminder of the peril at hand. The incident drew national attention, with then-President George W. Bush denouncing the dreadful assault. The devastation in the police department was palpable as they grappled with the fact that a child had been targeted. This was beyond what anyone had anticipated. Over the course of five days, seven shooting incidents had taken place in the Washington, D.C. area. The FBI joined the investigation and offered a hefty $200,000 reward to anyone who could provide information about the culprits. It became apparent that this was not just the work of a single killer. Investigators suspected that a duo or even a group of ruthless criminals were involved. In order to gather more evidence, they carried out a forensic walk, methodically walking shoulder to shoulder, examining the area around the scene of the shootings. Their efforts led them to a trampled patch of shrubs, which appeared as though someone had been lying there. However, the most intriguing discovery was a mysterious tarot card, which bore a chilling message for the police. It read, For you, Mr. Police Code, call me God. Do not release to the press. The unsettling nature of this message didn't go unnoticed by the police. The killers made no demands, which posed a challenge. Yet it allowed the police to create a channel of communication. The authorities aimed to respect the killers' wishes by not revealing any information to the media. However, keeping it under wraps proved to be nearly impossible, as it appeared on the Washington Post's front page the very next day. In the evening of October 9th, Dean Myers, a 53-year-old veterinarian, was on his way back home from Virginia to Maryland. He made a stop at around 8 p.m. to refuel his car. It was during this time when a .223 caliber bullet cruelly ended his life. The incident sparked a massive police investigation involving over 200 dedicated officers. Two days later, on October 11th, a similar fate befell Ken Bridges. He was at a gasoline station in Virginia when a sniper struck him down. The tragedy continued to escalate. As of October 14th, even the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FB1 itself, became directly affected. Linda Franklin, an FBI analyst, and her husband Ted were in the midst of loading newly purchased shelves into their car. Linda, a remarried mother of one and soon-to-be grandmother, merely paused for a moment, allowing her husband to adjust the loaded furnishings. That brief moment was all that was needed for a bullet to claim the right side of her head. Linda became the eleventh person to fall victim to the ruthless DC sniper. The FBI petitioned the Department of Defense for permission to deploy advanced military spy planes, equipped with cutting-edge surveillance technology, to track down the sniper. In tandem, the police disseminated sketches of a white van. On October 16th, a glimmer of hope materialized in the form of a witness, Matthew Doughty, who claimed to have seen a Middle Eastern man firing a shot. Doughty claimed that the shot was fired near a hardware store, and he had noticed a cream or white van with a dysfunctional taillight. Subsequently, the police cautioned the public to be vigilant. However, two days later, a sleuth studying the surveillance footage from the hardware store noted that Dowdy was captured in the camera at 9.21 p.m., a full three minutes after the shooting. It was thus rendered impossible for Dowdy to have witnessed the shooter. As it turned out, Dowdy was merely attempting to gain media visibility, and he was swiftly taken into custody. The investigation team once again found themselves at the starting line. Even though the police diligently analyzed the suspects in the surveillance footage, their efforts were futile. However, a glimmer of hope emerged in the form of Robert Holmes. While observing the DC sniper shootings on the news, a sudden realization struck him. He identified a potential connection between the sniper and his old military companion, John Muhammad. He recalled that John was in possession of a long-range rifle, similar to the one used in the shootings. Additionally, Robert could suggest a possible motive. John's estranged wife, who had custody of their children, was residing in the Washington, D.C. area. As absurd as this theory might initially sound, it provided some areas for investigation. Robert Holmes made the decision to call the tip line, but his contribution fell through the cracks. During this period, the real sniper was also endeavoring to make contact with the authorities, but was unable to break through the deluge of incoming tips. Adding complexity to this predicament, there were numerous individuals attempting to claim responsibility for the acts of terror. This situation caused the true perpetrator to worry that someone else might receive credit for his abhorrent actions. In an attempt to ascertain his authorship, he pointed the police towards an unsolved Alabama shooting that had taken place earlier in the year during one of his calls. 
When Montgomery contacted the authorities, they discovered it was a case of armed robbery turned into a homicide. The weapon of choice, however, was not a high-caliber rifle as was assumed. Police failed to establish any correlation due to the different weaponry used, and also the fact that none of the sniper's victims were robbed. Hence, the possible connection was dismissed, and the call fell on deaf ears. Jeff Hopper and his wife Stephanie, while returning to their home in Florida on October 9th, decided to stop at a fuel station nearly 150 kilometers south of Washington. Here, they decided to fuel up their car and enjoy a peaceful dinner, assuming themselves to be safe from any potential threat. Post-dinner, as they were returning to their car, a gunshot rang in the air. It took a few moments for Jeff to realize that he was the target and had been shot in the abdomen. It was after five surgeries and 18 grueling days that he could finally recover from this close brush with death. This incident marked him as the third survivor of the DC snipers. During the examination of a specific shooting incident, an ATF canine discovered a bullet shell and a note attached to a tree in the forest near the eatery. This was the murderer's unique way of conveying a message. The message was safely stored in a Ziploc bag, which ultimately became the reason for the murderer's slip, as the police found DNA on the bag. However, the DNA did not match any profiles in the FBI's database. Within the note, a message was found that contained the killer's signature, Call Me God phrase. And for the first time, they demanded a ransom of $10 million to be deposited in a bank account. At this moment, the police were confident that they would catch the perpetrator. The sniper also revealed that they would call the restaurant where Jeffrey Hopper had been shot at exactly 6 a.m. Consequently, the police force prepared to receive the call. On the morning of October 21st, the phone rang, and the police were finally in direct contact with the sniper. He instructed the police to follow the instructions in his note, threatening to kill more people if they failed to comply. The note ended with a disturbing warning. P.S. Your children are not safe. The police managed to trace the call to a petrol station, where they arrested two men. One of them drove a white panel truck, and both men fit the description. However, it turned out they were just illegal immigrants who happened to be near the phone at the wrong time. The sniper's note also mentioned an Alabama shooting, prompting the police to contact Alabama again. This time, they discovered a significant clue. A magazine left at the crime scene with a fingerprint on it. The local officer hadn't processed it yet. The magazine was flown to Washington immediately, and the fingerprint matched a boy named Lee Boyd Malvo. Immigration officers in Washington had taken Lee Boyd Malvo's fingerprints, who was a 17-year-old Jamaican. The discovery was a mixture of luck, perseverance, and foolishness by the sniper. The police were counting on more mistakes from him, but they assumed the teenager was just an assistant. On October 22nd, in the heart of Montgomery County, bus driver Conrad Johnson was getting ready for the morning commute when the murderer added him to the list of victims. At the age of 35, Johnson was a father of two. The ruthless killer attached a new message to a tree, stating that their incompetence had cost them another life. Despite the message's frustration, the police used it to motivate their search efforts. They now had a confirmed fingerprint and a picture linked to the teenager, Lee Boyd Malvo. The FBI provided more information about the young man. In addition to his immigration history, it was uncovered that there had been a custody battle between Malvo's mother and an African-American man named John Muhammad. Since then, Lee Malvo and John Muhammad had assumed the roles of father and son, thanks to Muhammad's assistance in helping Malvo and his mother enter the country illegally from the Caribbean. Additionally, the FBI was able to sift through the tips and find Muhammad's friend Robert Holmes's tip. He tied up all the ends literally with his tip. Robert Holmes had been friends with John Muhammad in the army for a long time. They had a tight relationship. Robert instantly identified the serial killer as Lee Malvo, a young person who had been hanging out with Muhammad as soon as he heard his voice. To wrap things up nicely, Holmes provided the cops with a potential reason. He claimed that John's ex-wife, Mildred, had taken custody of their children and moved them to Washington in an effort to keep the children as far away from John's oddities as possible. Dead ends that had lasted for days or weeks vanished in an instant. The authorities were able to obtain all of the suspect's personal information, including the blue Chevy Caprice that John Muhammad had registered. The police announced it right away. A blue Chevy Caprice is something to be on the lookout for. On October 24th, a day after the police had issued the alert, Whitney Donahue was working late when he decided to head home because he was too exhausted to work any longer. Since he still had hours to get home at 11.39 p.m., he made the decision to turn on the radio in order to keep himself awake while driving. It was at this point that he heard the news. A blue Chevy Caprice was what the police were hunting for. 
Whitney recognized the appearance of a Chevy Caprice from his previous ownership. He headed in the direction of the Beltway, checking out the cars in his subconscious. And he made the choice to pause at the South Mountain Rest Area when he turned onto Route 70. That's when he noticed it. A Chevy Caprice in dark blue. He parked in front of the car, took out his cell phone, and dialed 911 because it fit the description exactly. John Muhammad and Lee Malvo were dozing off in the car when the entire police force surrounded them. After 21 mindless days of terror, it was finally over. John Allen Muhammad was 40 years old, and Lee Malvo was only a 17-year-old youngster. It turned out that John had spent weeks training him to carry out the atrocities. Additionally, Muhammad and Malvo had shot six people between February and roughly October prior to the October shootings. Compared to the October serial shootings, the shootings were so few that the perpetrators were able to go unnoticed. They had dug a hole in Caprice's trunk through the October killings, allowing Lee Malvo to squirm while John Muhammad grabbed the wheel. Malvo initially refused to speak during questioning, but as soon as he started speaking, he would start bragging. He described fasting before every kill because it let him hit the target more accurately. In an attempt to demoralize the police, he went on to say that they intended to carry out five murders all in one day. Subsequently, he started discussing his association with John Allen Muhammad. He referred to him as his best friend and father at different points in time. He claimed that all of his knowledge came from Muhammad. Investigators thought John Muhammad was on a murderous rampage as part of a devious scheme to assassinate his ex-wife and reclaim their children. The niece of a friend of his ex-wife, who had persuaded her to go to Washington, was their first victim in February. She must have been part of his plot to make her one of the random victims so he could get his kids back. This theory failed in court because Muhammad did not support it with sufficient evidence, and he did not deny it either. John did attempt to represent himself, though, and that proved to be a fatal nail in his nearly certain coffin. On November 10, 2004, a Virginia court sentenced John Allen to death by lethal injection. However, Lee Malvo did not stop spilling. He discussed Muhammad's multi-phase plan in his testimony. The first phase involved careful planning, a number of logistical problems, including heavy traffic, a clear line of sight, and an escape path at their kill places, prevented them from carrying out their plan, which called for killing six white individuals every day for 30 days. Ultimately, they turned to October's equally destructive mayhem. Subsequent to the events in October in Baltimore, Maryland, there was also anticipated to be a second phase. These depraved people intended to shoot a pregnant woman in the stomach in order to murder her. Following the shooting of a Baltimore police officer, they planned to plant and blow up the funeral, at which point a number of additional cops would be present. The 10 million would be useful in the third and final phase. After extracting millions from the U.S. government, they intended to head north to Canada. They would make a stop at a YMCA or orphanage somewhere along the route to pick up naive young black lads, whom John would subsequently brainwash in the same way as he had Malvo. They would then travel all the way to Canada to train in stealth and weaponry before wreaking unheard of havoc on numerous American cities. Thankfully, none of those things occurred. Two years later, Lee Boyd Malvo, then 17 years old, was sentenced to life in prison. A Maryland court sentenced him to six consecutive life terms, and the October 2002 carnage went down in history.